Outrocast. Aside from doing press, good day for you so far? <laughs> this is That doesn't make it uh, less of a day. I, I enjoy, uh, you know, you work our, your ass off on something for years, and then it's it's fun to reflect back on it, And unless it was a total disaster, I guess, but happily not the case here. So, no, I'm, I'm grateful for the chance to uh, speak about it and, you know, give all the shout outs to the wonderful folks got to work with, all that kind of stuff. You'd be surprised how many interviews that I do that it, it goes either this is their replacement for therapy and they love talking about themselves or the, oh, I don't want to talk about myself. How many of these for them I'm contractually obligated to do? OK, so <laughs> well, like, to be clear to me, it's always about the work. It's never about me, uh, you know, like to the extent that it's about me is just sort of out of necessity to unpack some aspect of the work maybe but i i love talking about the folks i work with musicians you know in the case of this one uh, you know i got to write songs with some great friends and um yep. uh, but um uh but then yeah it's not so much i just assume it's not interesting to hear things about me it's not so much that i think there's something wrong with that i just am like well i i respect the future you know, readers and listeners and viewers time. <laughs> I, I hear you. That is a little self-deprecating right there. But if I can start with the compliments right here, you know, a lot of the times when I interview a singer songwriter and they have an album out every year and a half, you go, you are prolific. My look, did you write 12 songs in the last 18 months? That's incredible. <laughs> uh, in your case, if Wikipedia is correct, you've written over 300 scores or collective work collections is that true um yeah i mean th that is true that number is probably pretty severely out of date but um that stems it's funny because that gets quoted back at me not terribly infrequently and i realized it was coming from from wikipedia at some point and i'm assuming that that whoever wrote that wikipedia article got it from some interview and it's worth um it's worth like I keep a, I keep records on what I do, um, and I have a spreadsheet that's so, essentially. So do ASCAP and BMI. And well, hope, thank God, yes. <laughs> um, but I, I keep, um, I keep a spreadsheet of every project I've ever done, and the thing is, right. every project gets one line on the spreadsheet. So, the first couple years of my career were probably two hundred lines of that spreadsheet because it was dominated by. Uh, a five minute student film that I did when I was 21 years old, you know, that's an item and, you know, Stray Gods, five years of work and six hours of music is also one line. So like the, the, the frequency of things getting added to that spreadsheet has gone down as their scope has, has gone up because there's just only, you know, so many things one can do. And, and I, and yep. I like, I like working on fewer things for which I can go deeper and, and push harder, you know? So it is accurate, but bear in mind that hundreds of those are terrible student projects or like, you know, I've not done much, but occasionally we'll do advertising work. So there's, you know, like a 30 second commercial is one line on that. Thank God I've done very little of that because I really admire those composers that can can do well writing uh, commercials and production music and, and jingles and that kind of stuff. I sound hate the it. Sound the well, lights. That, that's a whole other. Like yeah, that's, yeah, that's a whole other thing that that you see. You can always tell when you're watching like a a TV show and they couldn't afford X, so they got the they got the kind of bargain sound alike. And I'm grateful that that sort of thing is quite rare in in my world. Not that it hasn't occasionally happened, but of, usually of um, it's not. It's it's also not. It's actually culturally very uncommon in games, which is one of the reasons why I love working in games. Is Game developers tend to say, you know, what can we do that's new and different here? Uh, surprise me. You know, they're far more likely to say that than like an advertising executive who is going, I was just at this concert and this song really hit me. And how can we kind of ape that? <laughs> and well, no, but, yeah, so, that, you know, I mean, so so what we've covered, recapped right here, uh, you you have been prolific. You're not as proud of some of the work as the rest of the work but you pride yourself on being original, but I'm adding into that. And you're one of the few composers I've spoken with who did an apprentice for Hans Zimmer. So that also makes you different. <laughs> well, yes, his, his shadow casts far and wide. Um, 
And um, yes, I have never, I've actually never been any composer's assistant. It, it, I, I got lucky that I got on my leg, on my, you know, I got my sea legs mm -hmm. as a composer early enough that I was able to scrape a living by in that window of time in which one is typically an assistant. So I've collaborated with other composers on a couple of occasions um, when they reached out and asked for help, um, which can be fun. Actually, I hadn't done that in over 10 years until this past summer, a composer friend, a guy named Lauren Balfe was scoring this Gran Turismo movie and said, hey, it would be cool to have some people more kind of known for games chip in if you wanna kind of join the team just for fun, really. And I thought, oh, that's a cool idea. Uh, uh, so, you know, I helped out a little bit in a, in a very, very supplementary role. Um, you know, he it's very much his score and and Andrew and their team. But they invited me to throw in some stuff. But that that was the first time I'd worked on someone else's project in that sense in well over a decade. Um, and uh, that was fun, though. It was a nice kind of change of pace. Um, and but no, yeah, I. I um, um, I like working, you know, I like to, I like to have things to do. I like to feel useful. So I like, I like prolific is a, is an unintended side effect of that. The goal is not unto itself to be prolific. I just am lucky that I've met a number of folks that seem to want to work with me for whatever reason. <laughs> and yeah, you're not on the, the bad list. You're, you're not doing your scores under alias. Yes. Alan Smithy productions is not me. Thankfully. Prolific director that Alan Smithy, I must say. Funny enough, I tried at one point to kind of clean up my IMDb to um, um, to get rid of a lot of those student films because it just it was like there were I had done so many like literally well over a hundred, and they all ended up on IMDb, and I thought I should probably make this look slightly more professional. Once I was doing real films and, and video games and stuff, I thought I should make this, you know, not be a bunch of little five minute films that were clearly made by clueless 20 year olds, myself very much included. And, um, and so rather than delete my name, what I went and I did is I, I came up with a, a kind of alias to, so that it would be credited. And if you clicked on that name, it would take you to my name, but, but it was like a one sided mirror where, on my so I created this name um, Joel, my father's middle name, and then my family's uh, German name when they they came over in World War II in 1938 and changed the name to Wintry, but they were named Weinberger before that, like Weinberger. And so I created this name Joel Weinberger, and I thought this will be very clever. I will I will delete all these off my thing. There will be all these films that are credited with music by Joel Weinberger. But if you click that, there is no profile for that name. It just takes you to mine. And so I kind of get to have my cake and eat it too, in terms of if by some bizarre thing, somebody finds a student film from 15 years ago and they really want to know who wrote the music, it will actually take them there. But it's not meanwhile on my IMDb. Then at some point, the kind of algorithmic automated nature of it got all messed up and it suddenly was basically making it look like I, ha I had changed my name. And it was like all these credits were, you know, under a different name and they all showed up there anyway. And so I tried to, I tried to get rid of them just in general. And I don't actually, I haven't even looked in a long time. This is all stuff from 10 years ago, but it was my, my ridiculous attempt to go, you know, prolific might be a good thing, but not if half of it is <laughs> films that no one should be talking about. <laughs> Uh, before I ask you a little more about Stray God, so some some stuff like that does happen I am on IMDb. The guy who does the theme song to my podcast, who has had a couple major label deals and has written mm. some major movies and TV shows. Unfortunately, the one credit that goes next to his name every time is the Adam Sandler movie, I Now Pronounce You Chuck and Larry. So it has the same parentheses. I now pronounce you Chuck and Larry because he had one song on the soundtrack from his major label band. So that eclipses so everything. Funny. So it happens to the best of us that IMDb voodoo happens. I, I definitely know that. I know that feeling. <laughs> but yeah, Stray Gods role playing musical available on multiple consoles. A lot of hype around it in a good way. Great people besides yourself part of it. When did you actually finish it? I mean, it feels like we're still working on it because there's just always little odds and ends and, and, you know, the nature of games is that you're, you're patching them and, and, um, and fixing bugs that people find 
you know, audio mix issues uh, with, you know, oh, on the switch, for some reason, this song triggers quieter. Um, and because, you know, you, you can't we I played through the PC build well, 120 hours, something like that. But oh. the ports I haven't played. And so when a port um, uh, it reports a bug, I, this is new information to me. Um, and so then we go and we find those. So there's a little bit of a, I mean, the game's been out less than a week. So there's a little bit of a servicing the release just to make sure. Um, um, and I mean, case in point, I released four soundtrack albums and for the life of me, for reasons I still can't figure out, um, only in the North American region on Spotify, three of the four albums are grayed out and you can't hear them. But my friends in Europe are all hearing it without a problem. And, and it's all fine on YouTube. It's all fine on Amazon and on Apple Music. And so that's a thing I'm still working on and trying to track down. So there's a few little odds and ends. But in terms of actually the core content, it was right. earlier this year. I don't remember the exact date, but, but um, I was mixing and recording musicians and finishing up uh, aspects of the underscore between the songs through until at least the fall. I mean, the spring. Um, you know, April, something like that, you know, sliding under the finish line as we moved into what they call the certification process and um, yep. where you're forbidden from continuing to iter iterate on it. Um, I'd probably still be working on it if they didn't have to lock me out basically at some point because things like this, especially the complexity of it, you know, little transitions, because I, I don't know how much kind of you, how versed you are in the structure of it, but these songs give you branching forks in the road every few seconds. And so, you know, you have all these transitions and permutations that are possible. And I went through and I audited every single one of them. And then I had my assistant play through just over and over and over and over and, and while screen capturing on his computer. And then he would send me the video and he'd go, okay, an hour and 12 minutes into this video, I, I thought I detected maybe a slight hiccup in the transition. And I'd go on and look and I'd go, you know, fuck me, there's a frame, there's a frame drop there, which makes it feel like we're about a 30 second note late. Oh, and so then I call the programmer, you know, okay, what's going on here with this? And it turns out, oh, we have to buffer some of the art uh, differently because it was causing a frame hiccup or, you know, it's just, wow. just a whole lot of fine tuning. So that process was going well into the summer, um, uh, even though the music was all delivered, you know, just trying to find, and even then I'm sure there's small issues. Hopefully they're very small and not noticeable by normal people and only neurotic people like me find them. But uh, there are those, I think, potentially little, little bits lurking. But it's the nature of video games, you know, especially one like this that it puts so much on the music. So much of this kind of stuff, I was really the only person who even knew how to identify if there was a problem and where to find it and how to fix it. Because the, I'm, you know, there's just no other part of the team who has that much background information on how the music was made. You know, that's just it's a straight, it's a flaw, really. I arguably in the process of doing so much of it myself uh, do you have time for two more quick questions and then i'll let you go these might be quick questions if they're not quick questions you just oh you're a good man and i had assumed at least a half an hour i i will follow your lead but you're you're uh, okay. no pressure for me to rush uh it, it's obviously it's the format of your show or whatever you you need i don't want to impose anything you're but too I, kind. I, you're too kind let let it be known you're prolific and kind usually those two don't go hand in hand chatty so. kathy is the more accurate but yes <laughs> So going down your filmography, of course, there's the BAFTA stuff and the video game award winning kind of things. But well, one title really piques my curiosity. And I saw this advertised, but I never saw it. The WWE Flintstones crossover. <laughs> was Does that stand out in any way from your film? Oh, dude, that was so much fun. Um, working Tony Cervoni was the director of that, who who's done a lot with Warner Brothers over the years. And, you know, I'm... Part of the reason why I moved to LA 20 years ago was that I always had an appreciation for those kind of that old school way that that LA you know increasingly used to operate where you know you go onto a studio lot like did you see the offer on Paramount Plus about the making of The Godfather I know about it I haven't seen it but let me just make sure we're on the same wavelength here the Gilligan's Island episode where the Harlem Globetrotters visit, visit them on the island you like the crossovers <laughs> well, let's not say necessarily it's all about the crossovers, although I always liked the Jay Sherman, the critic crossover oh, episode of The Simpsons. Fantastic. Um, you are and, totally uh, correct. Yeah. And yeah, that's 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 a solid one. Um, and I liked the Family Guy episode where they go to Springfield. But um, 
But yeah, so, you know, typically it doesn't necessarily breed the most creative. Although I'm a big longtime Buffy and Angel fan, and I really loved the way that, especially in the earlier seasons, characters would kind of drift back and forth knowing that they aired back to back as a block each night. I like that. That's cool. That's not really crossover so much as it's almost like an early version of a cinematic universe more than a crossover concept. Yeah. Way before but, MCU happened and all that. You're totally yep, right. Yeah, and arguably Star Trek, Deep Space Nine and Next Generation did the same thing. And they were definitely aware mm -hmm. of the goings on of um, Voyager. So in any case, all that said, um, the uh, the thing that I um, that I loved about that, or what I mean by when I say old school, is that, and the reason I brought up the offer, there's a great scene in the offer where uh two of the characters are in kind of like a golf cart driving across the paramount lot and they did it as this long one -er shot where they're driving this golf cart and the camera's placed in like a pilot vehicle ahead of them looking backwards so they're, they're kind of facing us driving towards us the whole time but we're moving in parallel and um they're driving by all these old sound stages. So at one point, you know, you see, you see like woodworkers building a set and then you see these guys in gladiator costumes getting ready to start shooting. And, and it's right. just one of those like magic of old school Hollywood kind of montage moments where you see, you know, just inches away from people. That's like a late night talk show host getting ready to warm up the crowd and then the gladiator outfits. And then these people doing this and that. And, and I've always just thought, I just, that's such a magical and beautiful thing. And, um, it's increasingly not the reality of how how film and TV is made. You know, so much stuff is filmed outside of LA. LA is sort of the like the corporate headquarters for the for the business, and but things are shot all over the place. And yeah. but I I always loved that, and part of that was the music as well. You know, when I moved to LA, five of the lots had big scoring stages: Sony, the old former MGM lot, Fox, Warner Brothers, um, and the CBS Radford lot had the Todd Ayo scoring stage, and Paramount had their stage paramount and Tadeo are now both gone so there's just three stages left and they're fairly busy because there's a lot getting made but it's not like it used to be that all five stages would be going all day every day and you'd have five full orchestras recording all the time and that's not the case anymore and so when the when the flintstones thing popped up um i remember going and meeting with them on the warner lot where you walk into the production office and they've got like you know the the um looney tunes you know the conducting the hollywood bowl like that absolutely iconic episode um with bugs bunny like in you know doing the conducting bit in front of the i can't remember the name of it it's shameful that i'm blanking on the name of it but it's like it's like you know it's some very you know bugs at the symphony or something like that but absolutely iconic and they've got the animation the hand-drawn cells you know under glass on the wall in the lobby when you walk into the building it just feels like make they make magic here that's what they want to do so those guys hired me to do this Flintstones thing. And I said, you know, can we, um, Hoyt Curtin wrote the original Flintstones theme. Please tell me we have the rights to use it. And they said, oh yeah, we do. And I said, well then can we do this old school, you know, the union LA orchestra, we'll do it at Capitol records, studio a with like a big band and we'll get some singers in to, you know, some SAG uh, session singers to come in and do the theme. And they were like, absolutely. And so I was able to do it old school and, you know, Bernie Dressel on drums and, and, and uh ah just like everything about that was just so much fun jerry rotella i remember played flute uh in the orchestra and, and uh, uh huckins on barry sax and, and i think dan higgins even played with us and he's like one of the most legendary sax players in la ever and um it was just such a blast to be able to do that and then of course to merge that with like okay we got to do some some wwe stuff so can i like quote some you know, like the Undertaker's theme and stuff. And they were, they got all the rights to that stuff. So yeah, that was, that was a quick little one and done. It was like the, the waning days of straight to DVD movies, DVD, you know, where it's like, it, it, it um, I think that movie was 50 minutes long or something like that. It was you know? really short. It was around the time there was a kiss meets Scooby-Doo. Yeah. Same, <laughs> still, still, they were same producers, you know, before like that okay so i'm glad that was a pleasurable experience for me oh so much fun conducting the flintstones theme at capitol and and also i remember doing the ending credits where it was the flintstones theme and then i got to like then go into my own music from that and they all kind of got smeared together i just thought this is just so cool this is why i moved here this is the kind of experience that you can only really have here and they're kind of rare 
And even though it was not an exactly a prestigious project, you're literally the first person ever to have asked me about that, quite literally. People sometimes find it randomly on IMDb and they're like, the hell is this? But certainly in, a, in an interview kind of context, you know, it's just never once. That's so funny. Oh, let, let me change up. What are your influences, Austin? No, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, exactly. Actually, the last thing I want to know is related to that. And in interviewing a lot of composers, I find a lot of composers are former major label artists. That's not you, as far as I know. But a lot of them are also originally they were metal people. They were kind of shredders, hard rock people that started off with Van Halen being one of their favorite bands. Was that ever you? Because I get vibes that you're more classically oriented. Oh, for sure. I mean, these two uh, paintings on my wall, uh, the one on the left is Jerry Goldsmith, who I would posit oh, yeah. is the greatest composer in the history of Hollywood. Yeah. Uh, and next to him, apropos today, the trailer dropped from Bradley Cooper is Leonard Bernstein, um, my two my two biggest uh, sort of heroes, not really, I would not call either of them inspirations in a strictly musical term in, in so far as I don't really aspire to or think I especially sound like either of them. Um, it was more that both of them thought about music in ways that really shaped me. Uh, now, Jerry, I do think is, I mean, they're both un unbelievable composers. You know, you could, you could do worse than to sound like them, but the goal was always, well, what's, what's, what's my, what do I sound like? What's my version? And we're an amalgam of a lot of influences. And most of mine do come from that background. But I've always loved the people that were that were mixing in things from a lot of different sources. You know, I've always loved the, you know, like uh, um, look at someone like Elliot Goldenthal, who 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 brought um, a real kind of intellect to his writing, but also a kind of psychoticness. There's a lot of jazz in his writing in a, in a kind of acid jazz sense that is just so great, even though it's really sophisticated orchestral writing and he comes from a very traditional education. Um, and then obviously, you know, the, the Danny Elfman's of the world who are basically glorifying- That's a major label artist right there though. So he comes from that world with Oingo Boingo. So there's an example of that one. He was kind of the first really. He was sort of the guy that broke the seal on that, which is why he spent at least 20 years convincing everyone he actually can compose music. Like he, right. he always was, he's always had this weird kind of um, uh, belief that he somehow isn't legit. I think Danny's a genius. Um, but yes, yeah. Jerry Goldsmith, James Horner, you know, Bernard Herman, Franz Waxman, uh, of course, John Williams, uh, you know, the I mentioned Goldenthal in terms of Hollywood composers, you know, that's definitely in, in today's, in today's scene, the composers who I really admire would be people like John Powell, um Ludwig Gornson he's a he's you know he and I yeah. are friendly Dan Pemberton's a real good friend of mine and he's I think he's you know one of the very best in the business he's just absolutely amazing and um so yeah and and all of them have in common that they they really know the the classical tradition but experiment way outside of it and that's very much where I find myself as well you know my goal is not to like John Williams for example very rarely it takes even one micro step out of a kind of traditional framework. That's why when a score like Catch Me If You Can comes out, everyone goes, oh my God, who's this guy? Um, forgetting, of course, that he had been a jazz musician for the first 30 years of his life. Um, but, um, and a very acclaimed one too. But, um, but, uh, but on the other hand, you know, someone like Dan Pemberton or John Powell, everything they do from one score to the next is playing with the formula. And that's what Goldsmith did and 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 that's bernard herman you know in a generation before goldsmith did the same and i i that that's that is the cloth from which i always aspired to be cut find my own version of that but to be someone who kicks over a new rock and says okay what what's under here today I, who, who god only knows let's find out well i find it really inspiring how much you've accomplished in 20-ish years yet not really not 40 yet, right? Almost 40, that kind of a thing. Almost 39. So getting oh. getting close, bearing down on it. So I'm looking forward to seeing where things keep going for you, what your work continues to look like, et cetera. So thank you for taking the time. Congratulations on Stray Gods. And congratulations, I'm sure there's seven things that you've written since then. I'm looking forward to hearing <laughs> those and hearing those when they're announced. Well, you're very kind. I, I'm... I'm grateful to have opportunities and, and have employment 
Uh, and uh, so, yeah, no, appreciate appreciate reaching out. And again, thanks so much for uh, I, I couldn't no wager on the planet would have led me to suggest that you would ask about that Flintstones film. Uh, but that's just so fun. So that totally made my day. Outro.